This is a second in a three-part series on drone cybersecurity. In this video, we'll discuss identifying vulnerabilities of a commercial off-the-shelf drone. The creation of this video was funded by National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Grant 1902-329. My name is Dr. Philip Kreger. I'm an Associate Professor of Cybersecurity at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. So, in the first video, we define the concept of what a drone is. We describe the common commercial applications of drones. We identify the components of common commercial off-the-shelf drones. And then we briefly discuss possible theoretical attacks on the drones. This video picks up where the first video left off. In this video, we will describe the methodology that is used by malicious actors to gather intelligence for a forthcoming cyber attack. We'll discuss the current research that was conducted using a commercial off-the-shelf drone. We'll identify and discuss this drone's vulnerabilities. And then in the third part of this series, we will use the knowledge gained from this step to exploit the vulnerabilities that we identified. So just to refresh our memories from the first video, what are the components of a drone? Well, most commercial off-the-shelf drones include CPU and RAM, Wi-Fi or radio frequency communications. They include a camera for video and photography. They include some kind of data storage. They include sensors, normally GPS. They include a battery and, of course, aeronautical hardware and some means of controlling the flight operations. But if we get rid of those last two components, what do we have? We essentially have something that looks like a laptop or a desktop computer or a smartphone. So essentially a drone is a flying computer. And as we know, all computing devices are susceptible to cyber attacks. So have you read about any drones hacked recently? Well, a few months ago, and right now it's March 2020, but in the latter part of 2019, there was a video that appeared in the mainstream media and on YouTube that was showing Chinese prisoners that were handcuffed and that were being collected at a possible detention center. Now, if you look at this video, you can see that this is a video that was taken by a drone. And if you look at the upper left-hand corner, it shows that this is a DJI drone. And then it has the other components that we would see on an interface for a DJI drone. It's not very likely that the Chinese government would post or allow this to be posted all over the internet. So how was this video captured? Well, in the last few seconds of the video, in fact, it's not even a second. It's like a half a second or a quarter second. If you slow down the video, what you see is this. And what this is, is Kali Linux, which is a cybersecurity Linux distribution. And if you can read over here, it's, I know it's very difficult to do, but if you read over here, the person using this computer is using a program called Metasploit, which is used to exploit computers. And so what had actually happened was a third-party cyber actor was able to either intrude into the controlling device or into the drone and thereby obtain that video. So what does this show? It shows that drones are hacked in real life. This isn't th theoretical. Two years ago, I started conducting research on vulnerabilities and exploits of commercial off-the-shelf drones. And here's some of the drones that we were using for our research. In the upper left-hand corner is a Holly Stone drone. The bottom left is an AR Drone 2, that's a Parrot drone. And on the right that is circled, that is a Parrot Bebop drone. Now, I'm only going to be talking about, for today's video, is the Parrot AR Drone 2 because there would be so much to talk about and each drone had vulnerabilities but the AR Drone had the most so I'm going to be talking about that one today. So we want to say thanks to the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University Unmanned Aerial Systems Department for loaning their drones for this research. And so here's this drone, the AR Drone 2 made by Parent, a French company, that's flying in my house. And the AR drone is controlled by a flight controller application that you can download for either Android or for an iPhone. 
and this is what the interface looks like. So this is the drone that's flying in my house, and this is me with my basketball shorts on. And if you look at the upper left-hand corner, it's showing the battery level of the drone. Uh, you notice up here on the, the, the second rectangle is showing the strength of the Wi-Fi connection. Uh, the third one shows that a recording is taking place, and you see in the far right that that is, what, that is the icon that you would use to take a photograph. In the bottom left-hand corner, you see the altitude of the drone, so it's not quite a meter. And in the bottom right, it shows the speed. And then in the center, you see these circular graphics, which is how the drone is controlled. So let's set up the drone to fly. And from the very start, we're going to identify vulnerabilities. And so I've installed the app, smartphone app, on my phone. And in order to fly the drone, we need to connect that controller, which is the smartphone, to the drone via Wi-Fi. Here we're showing that the ESSID, or essentially the access point name, is UA Lab right here. And so we're going to select that so that we can connect our smartphone to the drone. We do that, and we see that now we're connected. And we don't have any internet because the drone is an access point, and the drone's not connected to the internet. So you can only connect to one network at the same time. So now we have the smartphone connected to the drone. And if we look at the specifics on this connection, we'll see a good signal strength that's using the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi spectrum. We see that security, that there is none. If we flip back up here, we see that we don't have that pad icon here, which means that there is no encryption being applied to this connection. And if we look at the bottom, it tells us a little more information. It shows us the, the MAC address of the phone and it shows the IP address of the phone and at the bottom it shows the gateway and the gateway is the IP address of the drone and if you notice that these are class C private IP addresses when it says no security that means no encryption and we'll see why that's a bad thing a little later on okay, now did you notice any other concerning issues other than what we just discussed about with regards to no encryption. First, there was no authentication required to connect the phone and the drone. That is, there was no username or password required to connect my smartphone to the drone. Well, that leads to the next question. Would the drone only allow a single user to connect at the same time? Well, in one of my cybersecurity classes, I brought in the drone and I had students one at a time start connecting their smartphones to the drone and we got the entire class to be able to connect. Now clearly that's not a good thing if you're talking about flying a drone with multiple users connected to the drone. This is Chinese writing that says know your enemy as you know yourself in Chinese. Now Sun Tzu wrote this in The Art of War and Sun Tzu was a Chinese general military strategist, writer, and philosopher who lived in ancient China. And he is credited as the author of The Art of War, an influential work of military strategy. So let's see how that applies to cyber attacks. And so malicious cyber actors have a particular protocol and methodology that they follow. The first thing they want to do is to identify. What do they want to identify? They want to identify the computing devices on the network. Second, they want to identify the device's IP addresses. Next, they want to identify open ports on each device. Finally, they want to identify any vulnerabilities associated with that device or with those open ports. Once they have that information, they can exploit those vulnerabilities. That is, they can attack the computing device. So how do you find the computing devices that are attached to the network? The graphic on the right displays a number of different computing devices attached to a network along with their IP addresses. Now where did I get this information? Well this is from an application called Fing and it's a free smartphone application that you can download for both the iPhone and Android smartphones. So this is called a network scan. 
And so when you use a tool to scan a network, it's going to tell you the IP addresses of those attached devices. Okay, the second step is to find the open ports on the computing devices. Now, I've used that term ports before. What is a port? So if you want to look at an analogy, we might think of a port as like a window or door on a building. So let's say that we have this very nice house right here that has a lot of sunshine. It has a lot of windows and doors. By my count, there are six doors and 12 windows. Now, if we were a burglar, this would be the kind of house that you would want to bur burglarize for the very fact that it's easy to see what's inside the house, but also it would be it would be probably very simple to use a hammer or some other tool to break one of those windows or break one of the panes of glass on the door to provide an entryway into the house. Now let's compare that to this. This appears to be a house in Europe, but you see that there's essentially one window and one door, and it appears that the window that's above the door is boarded up. So if we were a burglar, we'd much rather have this sort of situation where there were 18 possible entryways into the house as opposed to this. Ports are the windows and doors of a computing device. And in a building, doors provide the entry and exit ways, and the windows provide sunlight or fresh air. But what do ports do? So a port provides a service. For example, when we're connecting to a web server, we're going to be connecting to a port that's most likely port 80 or port 443. Notice that ports are normally associated with numbers. If we want to download our email, we might attach to a server that has port 143 or 993 open. And when we're sending email, we're attaching to a port 25. So if we want to burglarize a house, we look for entryways into a house, doors and windows. If we are a malicious cyber actor, we look for open ports and insecure ports. And so this is the Fing application again. You notice that I've selected one computing device on my network, and you see that there are four open ports, 2280, 5900, and 8080. And it also tells you what that port is used for. Notice two of the ports are associated with web services. So now knowing that, let's scan our AR drone. So to scan the drone, we used ZenMap, which is a free and open source network mapping tool, which is essentially a front end to the tool NMAP. And so ZenMap provides a nice graphical interface. And you can see at the bottom where you can obtain ZenMap. And so how did I do this? Well, in order to scan the drone to identify open ports, I had to be connected to it. And so I connected my MacBook Pro, and you see here at the bottom where I'm connecting to the network right here. This UA Lab again was the name of the access point, which is the drone, the ESSID. And then I scanned the drone. And so ZenMap identified seven open ports. And so if you look here at the very left, you see that the port numbers 21, 23, all the way to 5559, you see the state, which says that they're open and they're listening. And then you see the service, which just means the best guess by ZenMap as to what service is being provided. Well, as it turns out, ZenMap guessed several of them correctly, correctly, but several incorrectly. But we'll see what these do in just a second. So ZenMap also identified the MAC address of the drone, if we look down here. Recall from the first video that a MAC address is like a unique social security number except for a computing device. And that number is associated with the network card. We also see that it identified the operating system. And here it's showing that it's Linux and this shows the kernel version. As of right now, the kernel version as of March 2020 is Linux kernel 5. So this is, needless to say, a very old Linux kernel. Okay, given those seven open ports, what do they do? 
So we see that they really come in three categories. The first is, is for transferring data and remote access to the drone. So port 21 provides a file transfer protocol server, which is used to move files back and forth between the controller and the drone. Port 23, which allows for remote access to the drone. And then again, another FTP port 5551. The second category is for the video feeds, and those are associated with ports 5553 and 5555. And finally, we have port two ports for navigation and control data, 5554 and 5559. Okay, our third step is to do a vulnerability assessment, which tells us which doors and windows, that is the ports, aren't secure. So for the vulnerability assessment, we use a commercial product called Nessus. And Nessus is a commercial vulnerability scanner that allows us to identify vulnerabilities. They have multiple versions of this product. They have a professional version that is used by professionals. And in 2020, they have a version called Nessus Essentials, which can be used for non-commercial use, for example, at your home. And you can scan up to 16 devices attached to your network. And so, once we scanned, this is what the Nessus interface shows us. And so on the far left-hand side, notice that it talks about vulnerabilities. It found 15. Uh, below that, it's, it shows it's kind of cut off right here, but that should say severity. And so you notice that these are color-coded as well. If you see something red or orange or uh, yellow, it's, it's going to be more severe than something that is coated with green or blue. So Nessus not only identifies the open ports, it, it also identifies the versions of the service running. And this information is then compared to a database of known vulnerabilities. And so this is the MITRE database down here. And so if you want to look at vulnerabilities of any particular computing device, that's where you're going to find that information. So if we zoom in on the most critical vulnerabilities, we'll see that the top two are labeled as critical, one high and one medium. And you notice that what I've got in the red rectangles in here, it's showing the actual service running. And so we have three that are associated with Telnet and one associated with FTP. If we look at the family of vulnerability here on the right, you notice that the top two say gain a shell remotely. So what does it mean to gain a shell remotely? So a remote shell means I can connect to the drone directly via a back door. So it looks something like this. So you have the smartphone controller that's controlling the drone. And that back door allows a threat actor to connect to that drone directly through that back door. And so let's look at some of the vulnerabilities that we identified. First, we found that multiple users can connect simultaneously. We were able to connect up to 15 users simultaneously to the drone. Moreover, there was no authentication required. That is, we could connect directly to the drone without a username or password or any means of authentication. So in the next video, we're going to use that knowledge to try to see how we could perform some exploits on the drone. And as it turns out, we're, we're going to find many more vulnerabilities. These were, this was just the very first step in identifying vulnerabilities that would allow us access to the drone. This video was brought to you by the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Center at Whatcom Community College through a grant funded by the National Science Foundation.